What's good, everybody? Thanks again for tuning in to another episode of Over Quota. Please don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review if you haven't already. And like always, the J. David Group, which is my company, is sponsoring this podcast. We help founders and CEOs turn their startups into unicorns by introducing them to CROs and VPs of sales with track records of generating revenue, building teams, and scaling growth. This podcast is also now being sponsored by Alego. For all you sales leaders out there, if you've ever absolutely nailed a sales training or had a rep who killed a presentation that you wished you recorded to be seen later by new hires or other members of the team, well, that's just one of the things that a Lego can do. Not only does it allow you to record your best content for practice, collaboration, and feedback, but it gives you a way to organize all of your best content in one place so it's easily accessible to help improve sales performance for everyone. That key word there is organized. We all have recording um, mechanisms and all that stuff, but how do you keep it organized and all in one place? Well, Lego can do that. Email me, web with two Bs, at thejdavidgroup.com so I can personally introduce you to someone that will take great care of you. Now, my guest today is Simon Teckel. Did I pronounce that right, Simon, by the way? You did. Awesome. Is the Vice President of Sales for Synchro MSP which is an all-in-one platform that combines remote monitoring and management with professional services automation, specifically for managed service providers. Simon, welcome to Overquota. Hey, Jay. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Absolutely. I'm super as excited as you might be. I'm twice that. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope I live up. I hope I live up to your expectations. <laughs> there you go. I anyway, know you will. So let's just start there with something easy. Tell me a little bit about um, Synchro uh, MSP. Yes. Your role there. Mm -hmm. For for sure. So um, Synchro MSP is a company that was designed for small business owners, right? Managers, managed service providers. Our founders used to be managed service providers. And like the saying says, you know, the best companies are, are born out of necessity, right? When you're solving problems that you're doing. Mm -hmm. They started thinking about like, what are the things that are driving my inefficiencies? What are the things that are taking me the most time? And they developed software to solve for that. Um, and it's really something a lot of small business owners do and, and challenges they have, right? Most small business owners are toggling in and out of multiple applications or systems to you know run their business and bill. And then you have QuickBooks here, and then you have a CRM that's this. And uh, managing all that is just inefficient. Um, so, you know, our Synchro developed software to allow managed service providers to not only run their business uh, and take care of their clients, all from a single pane, one single view, um, and to automate all of that. As a small business owner myself, I know that pain um, from a, another professional services angle. So I get that for sure. It resonates. Um, let's zoom back out a little bit. Give me the Simon Teckel backstory, if you will, the making of Simon um, Simon Teckel as, as, as we see you here today. Yeah. So, um, you know, I have been in sales my entire life. I've held every single sales role that you could think of. Um, I started off telemarketing, uh, calling people, you know, and uh, trying to get donations for uh, the Ohio Patrolman's Benevolent Association. I have um, went door to door before. I've done cold calling for a mortgage company trying to get people to refinance their home. I sold cell phones at Kmart. <laughs> that was a ton of fun. Uh, and, um, you know, I've individual contributor role, frontline sales manager, regional director, head slash VP of sales as well. So I've, I've held every single sales role that you could, that you could think of. And, um, you know, that has given me a ton of experience and a unique perspective in kind of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, it's really shaped. I always, you know, I always like to stay close to the trenches. You know, I don't want to ever be too far removed from individual contributors, no matter where I go in my career or what title I I may hold because um, I remember those days and 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 uh, those uh, still get me excited staying close to uh, the frontline individual contributors. I know you've had some some successful exits um, throughout your career. Talk to me about talk to me about the first one and what you uh, what you learned from that. Looking looking back at it, yeah. So uh, the first startup I ever joined was a company called Everyday Health. Um, they were a competitor to WebMD, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I was brought on to the small business division. We were calling on doctors and uh, group practices and hospitals to sell them advertising spots on, on the everyday health website. Um, that was my first experience of startup life being scrappy and not having things really figured out and, and, and trying to figure them out on the fly, going to trade shows and cold calling and trying to understand all of that. Um, you know, I, I joined that company in late 2009 um, and I uh, was able to grow and, and build that uh, company. And we ended up IPOing in 2014. Um, which was a heck of a ride and uh, a ton of fun seeing that happen. Um, so that was my first experience with, uh, with a startup. It's the stars aligned and it's a story not many people get to say, you know, my first startup had a successful yeah. exit and uh, I'm glad I can kind of hang my shoes on that. <laughs> how, how, how did you get that opportunity to begin with, right? To, 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 you know, even apply and to interview at Everyday Health. What was it that uh, sort of experience that you have going into that? And then, you know, like you said, not everybody has that experience where, you know, your first startup and, and then five years later, you're IPOing. So, um, you know, what was that, um, what skill set did you come in with? And then what skill set were built through those five years that sort of enabled you to, to be so successful? Yeah. Um, so our VP of sales at Everyday Health believed in a one call close. Okay. Um, we were selling to doctors and, you know, he said, you're, you don't have much, you don't get a second chance with them. Uh, and uh, we had to show a tremendous amount of value and uh, try to convert and, and close them right, right, right there. Um, and he was right. We didn't get, we did very rarely with a doctor going to get a second chance, especially on marketing stuff. Um, so how I found the opportunity was um, from a job ad on LinkedIn. I didn't know what essentially I was, I was looking for. I just saw an opportunity with a startup and uh, there was some technology in place and said, hey, this looks interesting for me. Uh, and um, at the time I was at Dell Computers. And when I took the opportunity, I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know anything about the digital space. I didn't know anything about startup life. I'm coming from a huge company like Dell, very established in the marketplace to a company that no one's ever heard of. And people know the, the existing giant WebMD in this space, you know? So that was all brand new to me, um, not having the brand. So um, the skill set that they were specifically looking for was someone that could come in, not only sell, but lead as well, mm-hmm. you know? Uh, you're hiring team members, training them, you know, you're going to conferences, you're teaching even doctors things about the digital world or things about their website that they're not even aware of. Mm-hmm. So they're looking for a specific, you know, skill set and, and someone that was comfortable doing that and speaking to doctors. Um, anyone that's sold to doctors before know that they have uh, incredible egos and uh, they're not easy to, to, to sell or convince, but um, that, was, uh, that was very interesting and fun. So two questions. Why did you go from, like you said, a big household name like Dell to a relatively unknown? What was it about that opportunity that, that drew you to it? And then, you know, as you look back at that experience, and I know you've, you've had others as well, you know, what did you, what did you learn? And then how did you develop your uh, team and, and, and sales team to, to sort of get to the point where, you know, they were so successful that there was an IPO. Yeah, I think what, I think what attracted me to the opportunity was it was brand new and something that I was unfamiliar with. Mm. I had a hunger for learning something new and, um, you know, I, and seeing how my skill set could develop and joining something early was exciting for me. Mm. And the unknown, the ambiguity was exciting for me. Um, and so that was really attractive to me, but also I connected with the VP that was interviewing me, um, as well, had multiple conversations with him, uh, flew out to New York to meet with him. Um, and him and I really hit it off. Um, I still speak to him today. He's one of my mentors. And so, um, that was a big part in the decision-making process for me too. Um, 
so that was like everything kind of bundled up for me to you know make the move over there and tell me about the so let's let's just fast forward right so you're at synchro msp right now mm -hmm. You, that opportunity way back then attracted you for the reasons that you just described. Tell me when you when you came here now to Synchro MSP, what were they looking for you to do? And then why did you choose that? Why did you, I'm sure you had other options. Why did you end up settling and, and focusing on, on these folks as opposed to some of the other folks that you had opportunities with? Yeah, so to be completely honest, I wasn't looking. Mm when I, I came here, um, uh, like most of the people you talk to, you know, they you have a lot of recruiters in your LinkedIn inbox. And, um, I wasn't looking, it, I, I, I reluctantly took a conversation with a recruiter, um, who had me speak to the COO, uh, and then who had me speak to CEO just to understand the company and understand who potentially I'd be working with. I think now I, I say to anybody that's looking, for, for, for a company, whether it's on purpose or, or not, um, pick the company first uh, and make sure you align with the people there. You know, you can learn product, you can learn a market, you can learn technology, that's, you can learn that. But if you are uncomfortable with the people you're working with, it doesn't matter. All the money in the world or all your expertise with a specific market or vertical doesn't matter. And that was what was most important to me is, um, will I have a great working relationship? And you can tell early on if you will connect and hit it off with somebody. And I've been very fortunate in my career that um, I've had great bosses or, or managers that uh, I have worked with. And so I, that is my North star whenever I'm like thinking about a, a move or a new company, it doesn't matter if it's something I'm comfortable with or not. It's, I go to people first and then um, everything else typically takes care of itself after. What did they want you to do? In other words, they, there was a reason why they were looking, right? They were looking, the reason why they're looking for our vice president of sales. What were their initiatives that, in, in focus that they wanted you to, to help them with? And then, um, you know, how were you able to sort of manage expectations and make sure that you're able to sort of hit those? Yeah. What they were looking for is, you know, as they're growing, they, they didn't know what they, what they didn't know. Right. Mm. And so someone who has experience at the level or the scale that they're at now and understanding where they want to go and kind of what's around the corner that we don't know, right. uh, and how are we going to figure this out? So the company is a product led company. Mm. And so that is how they've grown to where they were at prior to me even joining. Right. So it's a fantastic product. They get it ton of inbound leads and things like that. But as the company is, is growing, um, thinking about an outbound team, right? We, you know, they've never had that before. How do we even build a SDR team from scratch? Mm. Um, what does our sales process look like, you know, as we're trying to double and triple revenue, looking at an international markets, you know, that's something that's, you know, down the line that they're interested in doing. So it was, multiple levels of things, right? With the existing team, growing the team, um, and how does all that come together? But keeping the core of the culture was, I think, extremely important to them because they, I get, a, there's a strong sense of family here at mm -hmm. this company mm -hmm. and um, someone not aligned with them culturally mm -hmm. was, you know, someone being aligned with them culturally was extremely important. And, um, you know, and uh, that was something that also you don't want to mess up when you have a company that's pretty successful already and you're bringing in a new leader mm. and you're asking them to do things and to change things. And, hey, we understand like what got us here won't get us there. Mm. So there will have to be changes made, but that doesn't mean eroding the culture, right? And so it's a very delicate balance and a lot of things that you have to think about as you're thinking of getting faster, getting bigger, getting stronger, mm. but maintaining the culture or yeah. elevating it too. Um, so it's a de delicate balancing act. A couple of things. When you say doubling and, and tripling, obviously revenue over time, how do you decide what is realistic and what's unrealistic initially, 
All right, actually, I'll stop there and then I'll ask the second question after. But tell me about that. Like when you're when you have such a blank slate and you're coming in, how do you know, given where they were and where you want to take it and where you say they are at, how do you know, okay, you know, in a year from now, you want to be here, mm-hmm. right? In, in revenue. Just explain that, that process and that thought process to me. Yeah. For anybody, when you're, when you're looking at that, that has to be a data-driven decision, mm-hmm. right? You have to look at what is your productivity per rep? What's my capacity? If you're a high inbound company, what is your inbound team or you know, inbound lead flow look like? What's my win rate? And, and it, it's a data-driven decision that like expectations need to be just made based off of data. And, um, you know, it's not just adding headcount, right? More sales reps doesn't equal more revenue, right? It's like, do we, ha- if we're investing in sales, are we investing in marketing too? In that marketing engine to deliver leads, right? Um, are we investing in customer success? Are we investing in technical support and all these different functions of the business, right? I, I, I say sales is a reflection of the company. It's not a silo. Sales is a reflection of the company. Everybody handles revenue. And so when you're looking at that and building those plans, you have to have very clear and clean data to make those projections and, and forecasts and expectations. Say, okay, we want to double revenue. Okay, let's peel that back. For us to double revenue, my reps are at, need to be at least at 90% capacity. And for them, and I need to add X amount of people and I need this many more leads. And you have like marketing, can you deliver that for me? Yes or no, right? Hey, this person, can you deliver that for me? Yes, HR, you know, we need to hire someone new every 45 days. Can, can you deliver that for me? Um, and it's a, it's, it's a team sport, right? Sales is in a silo. And, and I think that's, a lot, you know, I talked to a lot of colleagues that are in the same position I am at different companies and they struggle and they get into these challenges, you know, with their CEOs and the board and things like that. And um, I ask, how is this model built? You know, it's like, oh, my CFO just built it and, or my CEO, my CFO just built it. And did you have any say in this? Like, where was the data, you know, that, 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 um, that confirmed or denied this expectation. And as a leader, it's your job, it's your job to, you know, manage those expectations based on data. What did they, what were their expectations of you coming in? And then how much did that change once you got a chance to look at the data and information initially like how far off were you were you you exactly in line tell me a little bit about that um so what so their expectations of who me slash whoever took this role Hmm. was to get under the hood and to understand Hmm. how much faster can we get where are we missing revenue how where can we optimize what technology do we need um, what infrastructure do we need to get ready to scale? Mm-hmm. Right. Um, it's like any, it's like any company, uh, we use there, there's an, we, we use the phrase meatloaf. There's an article, I'll send it to you about, mm-hmm. uh, mom and daughter making meatloaf, making it a certain way. And the daughter says, well, mom, why do you make it this way? And, you know, the mom says, well, my mother made it this way, you know? So they asked the grandma, like, why do you make it this way? And the grandma's like, well, I don't, my mom made it this way, right? And no one knew why it was made this way, right? We always say like, it was meatloaf. We just always do it this way. Right. And when you're starting off and things like that, it's, um, it's easy to have a lot of meatloaf. We just do it that way because it just gets it done, right? And then you get a lot of, but as you're growing and you're trying to build some infrastructure to scale, hmm. you get a lot of tech debt, right? It's like, okay, this works, but you know, this, this can't work if we double or triple our lead flow. We, this can't work if we're trying to go international. This can't work if we're adding this many, these new products or these new features. So mm. I think it was just getting under the hood and saying, hey, where are our deficiencies? Where can we get faster? Where do you see us getting better? And what is the plan for rolling out, you know, um, how we fix these things to get us ready? Right, right. Going back to culture for a second, how do you keep that culture um, the same, I guess, if you will, like, what are, are there tactical approaches that you take or decisions that you, that you make in order to keep the culture the way that it has been, but yet still obviously making it more of a sales driven culture, I guess, as opposed to, um, as you were saying, product led, like how, what are some of the things that you are doing and that you needed to do to think about that? Yeah. So there, other, other than saying early on that, I will do my best or it will be a priority for me to keep the culture. There's nothing else to culture that I can truly add early because I don't understand the culture. 
Mm. Right. You don't understand the culture until you're interacting with people on a day-to-day basis. You have to understand on an interview, it's very different when you're talking to the leaders of the company, but mm. when you get and you're talking to the individual contributors to the people, you know, people on different teams and different departments, like you truly understand what is the culture of this company. Mm. Right. Um, so that un- once you understand the culture, then you understand how you fit in, right? And, and then you understand how you can maintain or elevate that as well. So um, it's a learning process. It's a learning process. You, get, you have to not only meet with your team, but you have to understand the kind of the history of the company, how it started, why. I ask a ton of why. Like if you ask like my team, they'll, they'll tell you, like I always ask a lot of why questions. But why, you know, why this and why that? You know, for me to understand the context of stuff. Um, so it's important for anybody to understand the culture of an organization. And unless you are being brought in and saying, this is a toxic organization, we need you to turn this around completely. Um, that's a different s- scenario. But for this, it was like, we love our culture. Our employee net promoter score is in the eighties as a company. Um, and so it's my job to make sure, like I said, I don't erode that. And how can I elevate and add to that it is I take that as a personal responsibility. What about getting buy-in from other executives or members of your sales team once you've looked at the data and have started to make the decisions that need to be made and saying, okay, you know, here's what we need for each salesperson is at capacity when they hit this amount. And we need to, you mentioned, you know, hiring somebody every 45 days. Like, how do you marshal everybody internally to say, you know, we're moving in the right direction and you're moting and, and you're and you're motivating everybody to sort of get on board? I, I, I know I probably sound like a broken record, but no mm. one can dispute data. That's facts, mm. right? So, mm. and when you can say, here's what the expectations are, but here's where our data says we're at and you show the red line and the mm. delta and say, here's why that is not achievable from where we're at right now. Um, no one can dispute that. That's not an opinion. That's a fact. And I think, you know, a lot of people have trouble calculating that data and understanding that data that's going to drive those decisions. So when it comes to executive buy-in, um, it comes down to, what, what is the data of how you're going to get from point A to point B, right? And do we need to reset? Was A not calculated correctly based on the infrastructure and what we have now? Or are we making assumptions on this forecast that we should also tell the board, hey, we're assuming marketing is going to grow by this, 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 and sales will anticipate. But that's the assumption, right? Um, so every decision has to be data-driven. You think that... Do you think that some sales leaders, as you alluded to earlier, struggle because they either are unable to make that calculation or they don't ask enough questions um, as it pertains to the data to set the right expectation and then to execute on whatever the data says? Like, where, where do you feel that leadership sometimes falls apart there? I think, I think it comes from not being comfortable or in a, having a, a, a relationship with your CEO where you can challenge that and based on data saying, I don't think it's possible for this because of this mm-hmm. and not being comfortable to, to, to say, you know, maybe you know, may say, like, oh, well, maybe this person's an underachiever or something like that. Mm-hmm. And so if you're not comfortable challenging the, a forecast or a, an expectation as you're coming in, mm-hmm. um, then I, that goes back to the, like one of the first things I said about when you pick a company and the people, that's where the flaw is, right? If you're intimidated or overwhelmed by your, by your boss or your, you know, the CEO, um, then I think that's a bigger issue than if you don't feel comfortable saying, Hey, uh, these numbers are off after I've done calculations, this is what I saw. Um, and here's what I'm expecting us to be at based on where we're at today. Let me ask you from the other spot, other position, let's say for instance, if I'm a, um, a sales team member, right? I'm a sales rep on your team and maybe now expectations are raised, right? In other words, where I'm now expected to bring in say 25% more revenue or 25% of last year's quota than, than I was before. And I know already, of course, that the answer is going to be data after, after speaking with you. Um, but how do you, is it that you, are you showing them the data and saying, here's where um, you can be given where the market is? Or how does, how do you sort of, get them to be 
bought into the number so that they feel that it is realistic, mm -hmm. even though on the surface, maybe it doesn't look if they're not actually seeing the data the way you are. Yeah. You know, I go back to when I was an individual contributor and quotas get raised during, mm -hmm. you know, every year. Um, and there was no other context behind it. Mm. Right. And there's not an AE in the world who probably, or I shouldn't say that, but majority of AEs go through the same thing today still. Mm -hmm. um, and I know how I would, how I felt in those moments. Like, okay, quota went up. Cool. What, like, all right. Like, I still have the same amount of hours in a week, and you're, you want 25% more output from me. It didn't feel good. Right. And so I learned a valuable lesson then that I've taken with me throughout my career is that anytime there was a quota change or process change or anything like that. I thought back to when I was an individual contributor, how much I loved getting the data behind the curtains from my leaders. Like I love to know what our company revenue goals were. I love to know how we were pacing in the quarter as a company. I like, I loved to know that information. I was like a big information junkie. Mm -hmm. So I take that with me. So now when there have been times where quotas raised or expectations increase, it's not only saying, hey, here's your quota, but I also go through, here's how we will get there. Here's how you will get there. The data tells me that you have four extra hours a week of capacity to run demos. So we're actually going to increase marketing here to fill your capacity here. Hey, I see that our win rate is 20%. I think our win rate can increase 15%. Here's the plan that we're going to institute to increase win rates, right? And it's not what is the end goal, but if you show them the journey to get to the destination, that's how you get buy-in. People say, okay, I understand that. I can see that now, right? It's not just here's 25% increase, Jay, figure it out. Mm -hmm. It's no, based on the data and seeing the capacity for everybody, here's the plan to get us to this. And that's how you get buy-in on every step of the way. Yeah, that's interesting to just use the information and be really transparent about it so that they can see, okay, here's the path. It's almost like if I say I'm going, we're, we're, we're going to drive to California or something like that. And you, they say, well, how are we going to get there? So, so just trust me, we're going to, we're going to get there, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and you don't know if you're going through rivers or yeah. mud or what, what you're going through, right? And maybe you're taking a plane and it's a smooth private jet, right? So uh, I get that. You mentioned hours of capacity. I, I had, had never heard that being measured um, on and and as, as you look at uh, quota attainment, let's just say and, and revenue attainment. How first of all, how, what is there a tool or technology that you that you're used to sort of um, look at that more closely, or how do you how do you yeah. know what each rep's capacity actually is in terms of time? Yeah. So you, you, most times it's done like, hey, a rep has forty hours mm -hmm. a week, but they truly don't, right? Mm -hmm. We have team company-wide team meetings every Thursday for an hour. And the first Thursday every month is two hours, right? Mm -hmm. With the managers, they have their one-on-ones and they have their individual AE meetings or team meetings, right? So take that 40 down to 30, essentially, right? When you get, so in, in our business, that doesn't mean a rep can have 30 demos or 30 one-hour demos a week, right? That, that doesn't mean that. Right? Because when are they going to follow up and when are they going to do their admin work? And you know, the thing we all love or hate or the love to hate Salesforce, updating Salesforce, right? Like all this admin stuff that has to happen um, requires time. So when you're, you have to look at, you have to take all that into consideration when you're, when you're understanding an AE's capacity. The second thing is understanding your business, right? How many calls slash demos does it take to win a customer? right? Is it one and a half, 1.2 demos per customer? If you're in a high velocity business for an enterprise sale, is it an 18 month, 10, like whatever, whatever that is, you have to understand that. And then factor that into your reps work week to understand what is their productivity per rep, right? Or what is their capacity? Um, and that's also what helps you pull the levers on when do I need to add headcount to? So it's not, so to, if I'm hearing you correctly, it, there's no um, dashboard, so to speak, that you can look at to say, okay, this is how much time they have allocated towards these activities, but more of almost first anecdotal and um, just sitting down with, with you, members of your team and figuring out where they're spending their time and how to ultimately optimize or help them optimize that time. Is that, is that right? hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned, you mentioned, um, 
you know, let's in, in, where, where we can increase win rate, right? Like, what does that look like, generally speaking, right? Like, I don't, uh, is that when you say, you mentioned, say, what takes one and a half demos um, to get to a certain outcome? Is that, do you, is that where you get into the more tactical aspects of, you know, listening to phone calls and getting a better understanding of, how they're qualifying opportunities or what it is on the discovery call. Like, how do you go about doing that tactically to increase win rates? Yeah, it's, um, it's not a sexy process. I'll tell you how we did it. Um, dumped raw data from Calendly and run that against accounts that were won in Salesforce to see how many demos it took to get a close one to get a true number. Back to my data point. So, so it's, there's no magic dashboard or, or anything like that, but to see how many demos on average are reps having with an account for it to go to close one and doing the math on that. And like I said, there's no <laughs> sexy way to do it. It's a long and manual process, but you get real data from that. That actually is sexy to me because like, <laughs> that's pretty cool. Because ultimately, what that is is, is it's a it's a it's a um, it's a data hack, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's taking disparate sets of information that aren't talking to each other, making them talk to each other, and then analyzing that data, and then coming out with um, an outcome or and a, or a a path to go forward, right? A strategy to say, okay, here's here's what we need to do, or here's here's where it is, and since this is where it is, this is what we need to do to to get our outcome. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. All right, you talked about capacity a little bit in terms of their the reps. From your perspective, like how do you prioritize what's most important to you? Because there are a lot of things that are important to you, especially when you when you're first getting going. And I would imagine, obviously, as you go on, right? There's mm -hmm. so many initiatives that need to get done. How do you prioritize that? And then how do you um, you know manage your time as it pertains to your priorities? Yeah. Um... The first thing, you know, you know, most people say, well, as a VP, I always think six months, 12 months ahead, right? Mm -hmm. I, I'm always thinking ahead, I'm always thinking ahead. And I agree with that, but it's not necessarily always true, right? Because mm -hmm. I, I have quarterly revenue numbers I have to hit, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, right. Um, like, so <clears throat> for me, the, you know, I, I can't think about scaling or what's around the corner 12 months from now if the infrastructure isn't set the foundation, right? We, everyone talks about the building house analogy, and, and it, but it's just so true, right? Because a lot of times when you join a startup or a growth company, there's been a lot of like meatloaf, like I mentioned earlier, and you have to unravel that and say, okay, like let's get the foundation and the infrastructure in place. Let's put processes in place. Let's put technology to automated streamline things. And then I can build something that's repeatable and, and predictable and at that point, it's just, I can add people to that when you're, I'm thinking about scale, right? Um, mm. So I call it a lot of like the go-to-market fit, right? Like a company has achieved product market fit. The next step before scale is like that go-to-market fit and building that infrastructure. Mm. Um, okay, now I have a process to go to market. Now we can think about scaling that out mm. and optimizing the heck out of that. So um, I battle this internally myself is I struggle sometimes I'm like I'm thinking now but I'm like okay well 12 months from now it's going to look so different you know and I have to like plan for that right now mm -hmm. um and like a simple project may take <laughs> 90 <laughs> days um because I'm like well I have to be ready for this scenario we have to be ready for this scenario we have to be ready for this scenario in 12 months or 24 months and um I just want to be able to look back and be like I'm so happy I did that then because this is much easier now um so so that's a balancing act I, you know as well for me but um, that's how I, how I prioritize is, is, is our infrastructure is everything set right now. Um, and then when I'm prioritizing, you know, my time, it's almost the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. I am, if I, if I look at like what is on my agenda, short-term and long-term, I have what I need to win and execute on. Um, and these short wins are spill into what my long-term strategy and, and thoughts and ideas are as well. So, um, that's how I prioritize. I prioritize my time based on what is the most critical right now. Mm -hmm. um, and at times you do get pulled into different directions. Mm. You know, you're 
sales team, your sales managers may come to you and say, Hey, you know, I talked to the team. We need this. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, then you march on that and that kind of takes you on a path to go and figure something out. And that happens all the time. Right. I love that stuff. Actually. Um, I love getting that feedback. So yeah, that's how, that's how I prioritize my time. When it comes to, you mentioned process and technology. So I always break it down into people, process and technology. Am I hearing you say that if you have the process right along with the tech stack, so to speak, you're able to plug the people in, if you're able to plug the people into those first two things, then there's a more likelihood, I guess, I don't want to say a recipe, but a, an increased likelihood of, of success. Is that Absolutely. fair to say? Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because the, when you don't have your processes and your, you can optimize as you go and as you grow, mm. You know, at 30 million, your optimization is going to look very different. And at 50 million and at seven, right? It's, all, it's going to look different along the way. But so optimization isn't a, you know, it's a, it's a constant thing, right? But um, if you have your processes in place where you can find the right people to just run that playbook or run that process, that's a lot more predictable and repeatable than the ambiguity that happens a lot with startup. You know, everyone's doing it their own way. We're just figuring out what is the right way. And I've been in those companies, right? A pre-seed or a series A, where we're just kind of figuring out our messaging and figuring out what we're saying and how to say it. And everyone's doing their own thing. And we huddle up and figure out what's working best because we didn't know, right? Mm. Um, so it's very different. But at that stage, at the stage we're in, or is we, we have all that figured out. Now, now it's just creating the processes that are repeatable and, uh, finding people to, to, to run the playbook. Is there a playbook that you can fall back on or rely upon, right? You, you, you've mentioned, you, you mentioned, um, obviously the first startup there that, that IPO at everyday health. And I know that you had some others as well. Mm -hmm. Is there a common thread, uh, as part of that playbook that when you got to, um, Synchro MSP, you're like, okay, like I've seen this before. Here, on day one, I'm going to do this on day two, I'm going to do this. And, or is it, you do feel like you're starting from scratch and you have to figure out what that pr process is going to be right specifically for that particular product that you're selling in that particular market. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. yeah it, it depends on your sales cycle and your velocity, right? So the, mm -hmm. the, 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 the playbook we run here is going to be, we're not, a, you know, we're a higher velocity SMB sale. Mm -hmm this is not the playbook. I was, I was at an enterprise company called uh, Payphone. That was an enterprise 12 to 18 month sales cycle, right? We're not running the same playbooks. You know, we're not saying the same things. The messaging is very, our touch points are very different. Um, so there is a fallback playbook for ACV cycle speed, you know, where you can, you know, fall back on and say, this is how we should be doing it at this speed or at this stage or at this ACV, mm -hmm. but you're going to tweak it for a little bit for every company that you're at to fit their model. Um, it's not a one size fits all for that entire vertical, but the pillars of it will mm -hmm. be the same. What are the pillars? <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, first we're a product led company, right? So you're, customer NPS score has to be extremely high, mm. you know, with product led company to generate the leads that you need, mm. for, you know, for that versus a sales led company where you're kind of going outbound and cold calling and, and running that as, as your motion where 80, 90% of your sales are outbound and, you know, the rest trickling through inbound as you're kind of, you know, people are knowing your, your you know, your company. Mm. Second is speed to lead, right? You have to be fast in the SMB space. Customers, will go to who talks to them first, right? And are you easy to do business with? Customer experience is paramount. So that's one of the things with my team now is when I, when I came here and we were starting to institute some changes, I told them, hey, the North Star for any changes is customer experience, right? And we are optimizing for customer experience. So everybody was on the same page there. It's like, okay, we're gonna optimize for customer experience first, right? If we win there, everything else downstream gets easier. So that's what we did. Um, so we changed our process to optimize for customer experience. That was speed, that was efficiency, that was delivering on what they wanted up front 
and not making them wait, right? We optimized to show, to enable the sales team to show things that the customers were asking on demos that we didn't have available at the time, right? We optimized touch points, you know, and what customers needed. We have a very technical product. We're talking about people changing the way they do their business, mm. right? I'm not asking them to buy something small or simple that they may or may not use. Like this is how they're going to run their business and manage their clients. Mm. Um, so we had to make sure they felt very, very comfortable with our, our, our product mm. and they saw value in that, right? So we do webinars too for them, training webinars and things like that. So we keep customer experience. That's been the thing I, I've, been shouting from mountaintops is we're going to optimize for customer experience. That means sales acumen, that means product acumen, and that means efficiency. Mm. Combining all of that is how, how, how you drive and push those levers. So in similar environments, when you talk about product-led growth, right, in, um, in, in, in similar ACVs, that those are pillars that you're now using currently. Mm -hmm. Because in other words, you are screaming from the mountaintops customer experience at other places as well, because in, because you know that that's the, the correct North star and then that's worked. You're like, okay, this is what we're going to hit on right here, right now. Mm -hmm. Got it. Got it. Got it. Tell me a little bit about the last and probably the most, I don't know what predictable or least predictable piece is the people, right? Like. How do you go about, given everything you just said, right? You got the process, the technology, you know, you're a product led growth type, type company, you know, you're focusing on um, SMB. So you understand the sales motion. How do you go about um, deciding the right people for that particular company and that, those particular roles? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, um, I mentioned earlier about culture, mm -hmm. you know, I, there's company culture and then there's team culture. Mm -hmm. You know, our sales team has a very uh, unique spirit. You know, there's people want, who do comedy on the side. We're very funny. People make fun of you. Like we're very just like almost like a goofy bunch, you know? Mm. Um, and so when I say that, because you have to find somebody who can mesh in that environment, mm -hmm. right? Who's comfortable in that environment. Um, there have been people that we have interviewed before that were great but we just knew they wouldn't fit with our sales team like culture and you can't have that as much as it pains me you know like that can that can kill the spirit of a team right um so back to your specific question about hiring first it's understanding like i said your team's culture right Every team, even engineering, product, customer success, all these different the executive team, everyone has their own culture within their group, right? You have to understand that. Second is you have to look at the profile of the people that you have right now too, to just get an idea of what is the profile of, you know, because for me coming in, like I'm evaluating this and saying, what do I have here, right? So it's evaluating the profile of people. Then I have to run that against of where, what stage we're at as a business right now because I think this is a key piece that a lot of people miss is your profile will change as you grow, right? The person, if you're a pre-seed series A, you need someone who it can handle ambiguity, who can handle things on the fly, who can wear multiple hats and who can, you know, things are going to break all the time and you got to be able to handle that. And if you're a series C, D, more mature company that has their processes and things in place, you need, you know, you don't need someone who can handle ambiguity where you made someone who can just drive the specialization of their specific role, right? So you have to understand is where am I at now? And can I find someone who's comfortable with the stage we're in now, right? That's part of the profile too. And then where are we growing to? Can someone, you know, everyone asks, have you been in a startup before? Or have you worked at a growth company? Have you been at a billion dollar company before? Hiring for the stage you're in is extremely important. I would put that above even the skill set because if people come in that are used to, like, for example, if you're at a startup or you're at a company and someone is coming from Salesforce or Oracle or these companies that have multiple different team members and engineers and, you know, uh, value teams and things like that. And it's like, hey, join my company. You're the sales engineer and you're the value team and you're the customer success person they are not going to thrive. And they may have been Salesforce's or Oracle's or whatever company's top rep, right? 
they they're they cannot handle the ambiguity and they have a large team like you have to understand that and i think that's where a lot of misses can happen too do you let me ask you this is there room for because that's a perfect example that i hear all the time right somebody from salesforce or an oracle is not going to work in this 150 person company or smaller mm -hmm. in a lot mm -hmm. of cases right um is that an absolute non-starter for Simon Teckel, where you're looking at and saying, eh, we're not going to, we're going to stay away from that person in, innately, or could it be a situation where, um, like you were saying, in, in terms of the, it seems to me like a eclectic nature of, of, of your team a little bit, where there are people with different personalities, there could be somebody that is at a larger company that has a strong desire to be in a smaller company for everything that you just pointed out. Like wh where do you, where does that, where do you, where do you, what do you, what's your thought process with that? Yeah, I, I wouldn't say it's a non-starter, but mm -hmm. I you would have to convince me of the why, mm -hmm. you know, and, and a simple answer is saying, you know, oh, I like to build things or things like that isn't going to be good enough for me, mm -hmm. right? Back at the earlier, I said, I ask a lot of why questions. I mm -hmm. do that because I like to understand your thought process, mm -hmm. right? Yes. It's not me challenging you. It's just saying, how did you get to this decision? I think when you understand how people think, it tells you a lot about them, mm -hmm. you know, as well. Mm -hmm. So I ask that I ask a lot of why questions and I would like, you would have to convince me of that. Why, right. With a story with, you know, something that has happened in your professional personal career that m makes me believe that you will succeed in a smaller company mm -hmm. when you're leaving this, you know, behemoth that you're currently at. Um, and that's really it. It's really just like, I hope like you can really sell that point. <laughs> You know, because the reason you hear it often, especially in your role, Jay, is because more often than not, it, it doesn't work out, right? Yes. And you have high expectations for this person, but they come in and they're just like, no, like, this is too messy. This is too sloppy, or mm -hmm. this is too like, nope, I didn't, like, I thought it was, I thought I expected some of it, but I didn't think it was going to be this bad or this like hectic. Right. Mm -hmm. And they just can't handle it. And that's okay. It's nothing against them. Right. Not mm -hmm. everyone is like, wants to be in a startup or a growth company and with growing pains and things like that. That's fine. I respect that, but that's a hard, that's a hard, that's a hard uh, person to convince. You think it's easier to go the other way? Go from um, somebody that's been in startups to say a larger organization with a brand name? Um, it depends on the person. Some mm -hmm. people love the constant hustle and ambiguity of startup life. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, some people just love to build, 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 mm -hmm. you know? I love just wearing multiple hats, you know? As a startup, you're, everyone's a generalist until you make enough money to hire specialists, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's like, um, some people just like that. You know, I know I'd like to be an early age. That's fine. Interesting though, too, thinking back on the early part of our conversation, because you did exactly what you just described. You must've had a pretty good story because you just went, you went from Dell to everyday health and, and, you know, it was a seamless, obviously a seamless transition for you. Yeah. I think it went back to me and the VP hit it off from mm -hmm. our first conversation. You know? Yeah. Uh, we had a 30 minute interview. Uh, we still laugh about it now. He, he tells me like, you wouldn't stop talking. You wouldn't let me off the phone. <laughs> we, still laugh, we still laugh about it. And uh, we hit it off and we just, um, I think like that, just that connection um, was what helped sway his decision, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's kind of how I'm feeling now in this podcast interview. I'm like, man, we only get, it's, it's almost, we're almost to the, to the hour. And I'm like, shoot, I have so many more questions <laughs> about, about this, but, um, I'll be respectful of your time and obviously the people that are listening, but I do have just one follow up to what we were just talking about, which it sounds to me like, um, it, as, if you're, as you're looking at and deciding who should be on your team, I guess, in particular, even at Synchro MSP is sounds to me like it's culture first. Right, it's culture first, uh, and then skill second. Is that a clear statement, uh, an accurate statement? Um, I I would say culture first. Mm -hmm. Then, what are the intrinsic characteristics about that person too? Got right? it. Yes. I can't teach culture, mm -hmm. and I can't teach grit and self awareness and coachability and drive. Like what? I, those mm -hmm. are the first two things that you know I can't teach that. Yes. And then, the least important thing to me is like skill. I know people will probably listen like, oh my God, but I can teach skill. Give me the first two. I can teach you product. I can teach you how to sell. I can teach you sales process. I can teach you everything else. Can't teach you grit, hunger, desire, coachability. Let me just, I have to ask this question. 
when you have um you know culture first and you have um you know the soft skills we'll call them right like mm -hmm. grit coachability and all those things and then and then skill last i feel like what you just described is almost a lost art or a lost desire i'll just say where, where, where a lot of leaders sales leaders and managers have very little desire to teach that last point because we're impatient we've got to get the numbers where you know, just, I just don't have time to teach that aspect of it. You need to come in here with it. Otherwise, just, just um, I, I can't consider you. How much time do you dedicate to that last piece when you um, are onboarding people and, 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 coming in, and training them as, of, of all the stuff that you have to do on a daily basis? Yeah, so um, I, I'm, a, like you said, I, I'm against the grain on this one. Mm. I, I view it differently. Mm. It's called building a team for a reason, Jay. Mm, right. Right. Um, so my job as a leader is not only to recruit talent, but it's to retain it as well. Mm -hmm. So what employee or what individual contributor is going to be more loyal to me as a leader and to us as a company than the person who has came and grown and learned how to sell and skill sets that they didn't have before? That's so a good point. when I look at building a team, that's exactly why I look, I hire it in that way. Mm. Right. Um, so to your point about training, like we, you know, we have sales managers and other AEs here at Synchro who do training and stuff. And obviously I, I, I I'm part of that, but they're mainly part of that. Mm. Um, but that's, that, that, that's why like mm. it's building a team. Right. And that's part of building a team is developing. But more importantly, I'm playing the long game too, Jay, is I don't have to worry about a 30% attrition rate. Hmm. Right. I won't have to worry about that because I have extremely loyal. I think the average tenure now on our sales team is almost three years. Wow. Wow. Right. Um, and so, so yeah, back to my point is playing the long game there making people feel like they're learning, developing, and growing mm -hmm. and learning new skill sets. It's how you build, I said, loyalty and retain individual contributors. That is just such a fantastic point that I think a lot of people miss or frankly, just don't care about, <laughs> to be honest with you. When you, when you talk about, um, you know, tenure and, and longevity and building loyalty, in building a team. Uh, I love that. That's, such a that's fresh... who your future leaders will be too. Yes. Right? Yes. Such a fresh perspective. And I would imagine you mentioned managers. You're in a, a role um, where you're, you're mentoring those managers and you're the, the, the Simon Teckel um, approach and, and philosophy in terms of what you just mentioned should, should be shared with them. And then obviously trickle down to uh, the reps and so forth. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, you know, that's alignment. That's a leadership pillar of mine, right? And it mm -hmm. doesn't matter what company or where I'm at. That, that That's a pillar of mine is we will always be a coaching or like, you know, when I, right before we uh, ended for New Year's, mm -hmm. I sent a huge Slack message to the entire sales <laughs> team. So then to every single person. And one of those things was, hey, we will be a coaching organization, right? That's a pillar of mine, right? And so, um, and part of that, the transparency is, you know, I purchased Gong, right? In okay. Q1 yep. this year, right? Yep. And saying, this is, I know we haven't had it before. This is not for Big Brother to listen in. Mm. This is for going back to that pillar of mine of coaching. We're a coaching organization mm. and we will constantly de develop and train every single person, right? We're not going to be complacent with the status quo. That's what you can, you can expect out of me and your leaders. Um, and so it all goes back to that right, is um, the, the managers, even beyond that, right, it Do, doesn't matter if the managers know, it's like, do the AEs and the SDRs and BDRs know that too, mm. right, okay, we, it's a coaching organization, so when I get feedback, or when someone's listening to a gong, or if I listen to a gong call, and I slack somebody, like, hey, I, I listened to your agenda, or whatever, and that was fantastic, like, I love that, that was great, but we share a clip on, on Slack, like, that's how you build that type of, um, those type of habits. And that's how you kind of emphasize those pillars too. 
I always copy and paste halfway through those long messages and paste and put it someplace else for backup. <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> actually a good right? call. Type it to yourself first. Yeah, exactly. Save it there. <laughs> yeah. In case something blows up or something, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's fantastic. All right. We have time for the rapid fire five. Awesome. All right. Here we go. Um, I alluded to this a little bit earlier, but I'll get your general philosophy, I guess, on this, which is, um, do you have a philosophy or general approach to prioritizing your time? Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny. I, when we, when new people come, uh, to join our company, I, I mentioned earlier, we do a team day every Thursday and that everybody in the company goes around and says like who you are, where do you live and what do you do for the company? Um, I always like to say, oh, I'm Simon. I work for the sales team, right? Um, and the reason I say that is because I may have my short-term, long-term priorities, but what trumps both of those is any blockers the sales team has, right? They pull, that, that's how I prioritize. An AE, which is rare, but if a manager or somebody comes to me about, moving a barrier or a blocker for the sales team that gets all my energy on focus right then and there. Right. Yep. That makes sense. Tell me about a setback that you've had and how you overcame it. You, you, you won't, at, you only want one. <laughs> I was going to say, looking at your pro, looking at your, your pro. I have lots. Um, you only Nothing want but wins. <laughs> uh, no, lots. We can have a part two on, on setbacks by Simon. Um, but uh, I'll go back to when I was at Dell. I became a manager at the age of 25. Um, I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know what to do, right? Uh, so I just managed people how I like to be managed. I was very money motivated, like, show me a dollar, I'll go get it, I'll run through a wall for it, right? Not everyone's like that. It's okay, I didn't know that though, right? So what I would try to manage people or motivate them. I put on quotations because I didn't know what I was doing. Um, it didn't work. And I lost three on a team of eight. I lost three of my top or most tenured AEs at the time. Mm. They all quit on the same day. Same day. Oh my the, goodness. Wow. Same yeah, day. Was... Right. And I know like people say like <clears throat> reps don't leave bad companies. They leave bad managers. Mm. I think part of that is true. I don't think that's always true, but in that scenario, hundred mm. percent true all three of them left because of me. Wow. Right. How follow up. How quickly after you became a manager, did they leave? Six months. Wow. No kidding. How did you overcome it? What did you do to sort of write the chip? I almost did exit interviews mm. with them. Mm. Why are you leaving? What's going on? Mm. Um, you know, they were employed at the time. So I got some very, very candid and raw feedback about how terrible I was as a manager. And that's when I looked in the mirror and said, I, ha I have to level myself up if this mm. is something I want to do, mm. right? Understanding management, understanding communication, understanding leadership, understanding all of that. Mm. So I started reading, watching videos, podcasts, mm. anything I could do to train myself, right? And that's something common. I don't know about reps quitting all at once and telling a manager how much <laughs> they suck, but managers learn on the job. There's not much training, right? Um, and so, yeah, that's a, it was a major setback for me, you know? How do you manage stress or prevent stress from overcoming you? So manage, one, one, one thing I do is I have to do something like active. So I, I love to play a lot of basketball. That's like my stress relief. Um, and how I prevent stress from overwhelming me is I try to anticipate it and I plan for it, right? So for example, we just, we just went through a price increase as a company. We didn't legacy anybody's pricing. We said, no matter what, everyone's getting almost a 20% price increase. We literally had war rooms for every good, better, terrible, even worse situation. And we had action plans laid out. So no one would become stressed no matter what. We anticipated the absolute worst. And we had war rooms and everything ready, entire company, right? Um, so that when the time came to announce it, we were, we were able to triage what we needed to and act. And we had 
you know, pre-writes and everything like that. So, um, so that is almost how I anticipate anything, right? We're implementing a new process, changing a comp plan. I think of good, better, best, or <laughs> worse, even worse, holy crap, <laughs> you know, and map out all those scenarios and be prepared for them. So that when you're in the moment, you, you don't get stressed. Starting to learn that <laughs> in my own life, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, what do you want to get better at right now? Patience. Hmm. Okay. I'm extremely impatient. Uh, for example, with yourself or others? Um, myself, with, which at times can go and reflect onto others. Hmm. So I wonder why things take so long. Hmm. Um, I, I for, In Q1 this year, I put in three pieces of, I implemented three uh, tech stacks. I implemented outreach. I redesigned our entire Salesforce process. I gong and drift, right? Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. like three, like all at once. People are like, you're crazy. You're doing those three in 90 days. I'm like, nope, I'm doing it. That's, that's me looking back halfway through. I'm like, man, I shouldn't have done all three of these, like really bogging me down. Right. So, um, took a ton of time, but that's, that's my, one of my flaws that I need to, uh, need to get better at is patience. <laughs> Oh man, I'm so, can I just follow up? Do I have time for one follow-up question sure. to what you just said? Sure. So how do you, all right. So you just said patience, right? How do you, cause I feel like I'm personally like that myself. How do you get better at getting better at being, being patient? Like, how do you, how are you going to improve that? Is there a book? Is there a video? Do you go back to some of the stuff that you did to get better as a manager? How do you, what's the process for learning how to get more patient? Yeah. Yeah. I, now it's, I always try to map it out. Right. Mm -hmm. I, 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 you know, I say, okay, the impatient Simon wants all five <laughs> things in Q2. Right. right. What happens if only two? What's the impact on the two? Mm -hmm. If I only execute on two of these, right. Is it a revenue impact? Is it a culture? Is it a P is it a sign? Like, what is the impact? Right. And weighing it and scoring it and making decisions on what gets prioritized. Okay. Well, okay. If I'm going to make objectives and key results for myself, I can only, these are the two that I'm going to prioritize in Q2. And I don't have to run through all five of these, right? And so it's really just taking a step back, back to the thing where I told you, like, I can tend to make a short-term thing longer because I'm thinking of like, oh, well, in two years, I'm going to need this to do that. So let me build that in now, right? Mm -hmm. And in three years, I'm going to need it to, let me build that in now. And being able to just kind of unpack that and unravel that a little bit and saying, um, what is going to impact this quarter and right now and executing that. So that's helping me kind of slow down a little bit. and. Uh, um, be patient. <laughs> Got it. Okay. I'm going to listen back at this one for sure. And lastly, what are you most excited about right now, either personally or actually not either? How about both personally and professionally? Yeah. Personally, um, ready for the world to open back up, right? Mm -hmm. I'm just ready to uh, socialize and, and be around people and be outside and, and, and all of that stuff. Um, so I'm really excited for that. Um, professionally, I'm excited for a lot of things. Um, our company is just growing. We're at a very exciting time at this company. I am so happy to be here. We're um, going into different markets. We're going up market. We're testing in different things. And so um, it doesn't matter what department you're in, in at our company right now. Um, there's so much changing and so much in a good way right? And how we're expanding and growing mm -hmm. that uh, everybody's just really excited. We just have a, a good energy about us right now. Bursting at the seams. With yes. Excitement. Yeah. Yes, for sure. How can folks get in touch with you to say thank you, to ask a question maybe I didn't ask, to perhaps maybe apply for a job there? What's the best way for people to reach out to you? Absolutely. I am hiring. Um, can reach out to Simon at Synchro msp.com or you can reach out to me on linkedin simon teckle t-e-c-l-e simon teckle thanks mm -hmm. for going over quota thanks jay I this is a lot of fun thanks for having me awesome goodbye everybody um cue in the music shout out to sales for the culture